Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we can come into your house and worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you, Father, that we can just lay all of our burdens, every heavy band, every fear, every anxiety, every um, frustration, whatever it is, sickness, whatever it is, Lord, that's coming against us, Lord, we know we can lay it at your feet. And so today, Lord, we do. We lay it down. And we just pick up your yoke. We pick up praise. We pick up hope. We pick up peace. And we ask you, Lord God, just to have your way in this service as we give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Amen.
and uh, just start quoting the word and just start a spirit and just let the spirit come out and let the spirit hover over in our home and such a difference in the atmosphere when we do that, right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but us women, we can go through a range of emotions in five seconds flat. <laughs> we can go through, we're like, Lord, come Jesus right now. I can't handle this no more. I'm about to beat somebody up. And then at a time, we can just twitch it and be like, let me tell you something, devil. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, it's just like, in five seconds in our mind, as a believer, we can go through these range of emotions. And I'm so thankful that God knows our heart. Amen. I'm so thankful that the victory is ours, that he has all of our days written out, and he knows, and he's going to be our strength, and he's going to be our banner, and he's our provision. He's everything that we need this morning. So when we say see a victory, we might not be able to see it in the natural. And next week, we're going to be talking about sight and what we can see. And actually, we're preaching next week. So you guys, we pray for you this week. And we can't, you know, we can't always see in the natural what we can see in the spirit realm. Amen? And, but we have to turn our focus, turn our perception, turn those thoughts and turn them towards the Lord and decide that we're going to see the victory. Yeah. I see this naturally, but I see what God is going to do. I see this naturally, but I know what my God is able to do. That's what we have to do. And the enemy doesn't like it. He doesn't want you to think that way. He wants you to feel the heaviness. He wants you to get down into the bed and be depressed. He wants you to focus on the things of this world, the things of the flesh, the things that are going wrong. And so this morning, we have to see that victory. See that victory. Today, we have victory. We have children. Our children are back with us this morning. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, no matter what we do, no matter what's going on, if we just wait for his presence, this song that Phyllis is going to sing, she sings it so powerful. When he walks into the room, when he walks into the room, everything changes. When he walks, when we allow him to walk through our mind, when we allow him to walk through our thoughts, when we allow him to walk through our heart, when we allow him to have his way, and we crucify our flesh, and we crucify what we want, and we crucify our right, when we let him walk in and walk through us, everything changes.
to New Life Online, and uh, it's so great to, to be with you through the internet and, and online today, and uh, we th we're thankful that you've joined us, and want to say thank you again to our praise and worship team, what a fantastic job of worship, leading us into the presence of God, Melissa and all the band and the crew there, thank you guys, I'm just thankful, 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 thankful um, as a pastor to, that God just blesses us with so much talent and so much giftedness in this church body and uh, I am just really really grateful for that also let me just say that uh, you have an opportunity to give and uh, you can click on that give button down there let me also mention this for those of you who may not have seen the announcement or the email that came out um, if you were normally giving through our online uh, actually our mobile app um, our mobile app that app started causing us some really uh, big issues, and the support from the company that we were going through uh, just wasn't there, and so we had to make a change. So right now, um, our mobile app is down. We're in the process of, of changing that information over, and you'll get some announcements about that soon. So if you normally go to the Given app um, or the mobile app to give, then just go to our mobile site or on your computer. Go to... Uh, and there's a link right down in the in the announcements and probably in the in the description as well. It's through our PayPal give um, through our app, uh, our website, and you can just go right there 
and, and it'll function the same way. Just it's a little extra step for you instead of just going to that app. So anyhow, <clears throat> just uh, go right there. We appreciate your faithfulness. Remember when you give to new life, you're giving through new life. And we're doing all that we can every time God gives us uh, the opportunity and the ability to be able to help people. That's what we're doing. And uh, you can mail it in. You can always do the things you've been doing there. And thank you for your faithfulness. Thank God for his faithfulness to us and to you. Uh, amen. Somebody say amen to that. All right. Now, one other announcement that you probably figured out already. I am not Pastor Lori. Um, she's a whole lot prettier than I am and typically a little smarter than me, uh, at least quick, quick thinking on her feet. So, but anyhow, um, we had some different issues arise and then we just decided um, in looking at the, the messages and, and things like that that it would work better to do this week's message like next week and then when, when we're planned to do next week, we're going to do this week. So I'm going to be preaching this one this week and she'll be preaching the message uh, to finish off this series next week on sight and spiritual blindness. Today I'm going to be talking about light, L-I-G-H-T, light. We are in our seventh week of this series, not just words, and uh, <clears throat> we're talking about light, light. Let me say this right off the bat. God's word is light. God's word is light. Psalm 119 verse 105 says this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, that's a very, very, very familiar scripture to most all of us. But I want to take a look at it before we move on from here. And look at what this verse is actually telling us. And, uh, and if you're in the notes, you'll see it there in our YouTube, our YouVersion app, or in, in the notes if you downloaded that from the website. Um, this verse is actually telling us that the Word of God is there to help us know where to take the next step and what path to take. Because a lot of times what we do is we just say that scripture and we don't stop. And we do this about a lot of scriptures. We say the scripture, but we don't stop and take a look at what that verse is actually telling us. So if we look at that verse in its context, what it's literally telling us, it's telling us that the word of God is there to help us to know where to take the next step and what path to take. Now that's so important in our lives because... Don't you know that Pastor Lori and I, and I can imagine that every other of our pastors and that any of you who are in any kind of ministry and, or if, if, if you have family members that know you're a praying, believing uh, Christian and, uh, or, or are friends at work or whatever, you've probably had somebody ask you the question or one of these questions, well, what do I do next? How do I make this decision? Well, how do I know if I'm supposed to do this or marry them or buy this or, or whatever the case may be? What do I choose? What's my next move? What step should I take next? I get that question so many times from different people all throughout my life. And so I, I, I say, look, this verse shows us exactly what we ought to do first or at least tied for first. You know, you could say, go to the Word and pray, or pray and go to the Word, or pray while you're going to the Word, or go to the Word while you're praying, and they're right there together. That's the first thing we should be doing, and this Word tells us, your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. <clears throat> now, let's, let's get into the meat of this message, and uh, I want to start off by telling you three things about light. Three things about light. First of all, light dispels darkness. Light dispels darkness. Now, let's take a little poll, and I know you guys are online, but you can take it, you can just represent it, even if you're by yourself. You can, you can represent in your, in your own car or living room or wherever you're listening or watching. Um, raise your hand if this has ever happened to you before. How many of you have ever been walking across a dark room, maybe you get up to stumble to the bathroom or you're going to the kitchen to get a snack in the, in the nighttime or something like that, or you hear something, you've you got to let an animal out or whatever the case is, and you're stumbling through a dark room and you stub your toe on something. Anybody? Anybody besides me? Now, let me ask you this. What would have happened if you had a lamp for your feet or a light for your path? You would have saw what was in front of you 
and it wouldn't have happened. Now, I want you to think about the analogy that we are talking about. And it seems simple, but the fact of the matter is we really need to stop and look at this. We are supposed to be walking in the spirit. But the fact of the matter is we're definitely walking in a dark world. How many of you agree with that? Would you, would you agree and say that's true? We are definitely walking in a dark world. And so I ask this question. How many Christians are stumbling because they're not using their lamp? Light dispels. That means runs off, sends away. Light floods into darkness and darkness leaves. And make no mistake about it, there is no struggle between light and darkness. We as believers are in a struggle with darkness. Our flesh <coughs> is in a struggle with darkness, but there is no struggle between light and darkness. If you don't believe me, the next time you go into your room or your house and it's light or dark outside, I want you to just flip on the light and see how struggle, how much of a struggle the light puts up to get to get the, the, the darkness to leave or how much struggle the darkness puts up to stay in the light. It doesn't happen. You flip on the switch, boom, it's immediately bright. You don't hear the light going, oh, if I could just make it a little bit brighter in here. It doesn't happen because light has no struggle with darkness. When light shows up, darkness ceases to exist. Are you following me? When we flip on that light switch, it gets bright immediately. There is no struggle. So let me share a scripture with you. John chapter 3 verse 20 says this. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light and that his, or that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Now, let me just say this. We usually look at this scripture from a negative standpoint or a negative um, mindset. But think about it. You know, usually what we do is this. <clears throat> usually what we do is say, well, I got something going on inside of me, and I don't want to shine a light on that. I don't want anybody to see it. I don't even want to know about it myself. I don't want God to know about it. I don't want light to shine on it. And so we're deceived into thinking that we're going to hide it, that we, can, we don't want it to be revealed. It's almost like we, we want to keep the bad stuff away because if we don't acknowledge it, then it doesn't exist. Like some people who won't go to the doctor because they don't want to find out what's wrong with it. Let me tell you something. If you've got cancer in your body and you, your body's telling you something's wrong, if you don't go get it checked out, the sickness doesn't go away. You're just denying the fact. The fact of the matter is, it's a good thing to shine light because then it reveals the issue, it reveals the problem, and it can be treated, it can be healed, it can be made well, and that's exactly what happens in the Spirit. Don't you want the Holy Ghost to help you get rid of all the darkness? I mean, you know it's there. You know what's hurting you. And unless you're trying to make friends with it, you need to let the light shine. Amen, somebody. You following me? So, remember, let me, let, me, let me give you an example. How many of you, and I know I'm probably going to date myself, and, and about half of you guys are going to go, what? But how many of you remember when cameras actually had film in them? You know what I'm saying? Cameras had film. My kids always give me a hard time about this, because I'll say, get your phone out and film this. And John David will be like, Dad, there's no film in here. It, it, no film. It's just a camera. No film at all. And I'm like, you know what I mean? Video? You want me to video? You know, you know, you take a picture, you can see it right then. Well, used to be, young people have no clue to what I'm talking about. Used to be, you had a camera that had film in it. And you would take up the film, and you'd take all the shots, you'd point the camera, you would click the button, the aperture would open, it would allow light to come in, it would make an image marked onto the film itself, and you would capture that image, then you had to take it and have it developed. Now, I know I'm talking archaic things to some of y'all, but listen to me. I got a good point here. <coughs> it's not original to me, but I'm taking it, so it's still a good point. Here's the thing. When you took that film, they would develop it in what's called a dark room. And you would put it in certain chemicals and you would, you would allow the exposure of the light and the film 
you would see the contrast and the colors and all that. And I don't know all the process, but I know kind of how it goes in. You dry it out. Well, this is what I know. What I do know is this. If you open the door to that dark room, light comes in and it ruins the film. It actually exposes it to light and it ruins the film. Now, listen to me. We are going around in our lives all the time. Everything we see, everything we hear, everything we watch, really everything we do. Because what do we do that doesn't involve our sight and our hearing? If, if we can see and hear. We're taking little pictures. Little snapshots everywhere we go. All that we see, all that we listen to, all that we watch, all that we participate in. You know what? I've talked to people about this before, and I had a struggle with this, even my own self, in, 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 when I first got saved, because in my younger years, before I, was, I, was, I became a Christian, I, wasn't, I wouldn't say I was really addicted, but you know, I had an issue with wanting to look at things that were pornographic, and, and many, many men, and the fact of the matter is, many of you women too, you just hide it better, um, many men, and then also many people in the church still have issues with this. And it's a big thing that the enemy getting us in. In fact, during all this COVID stuff, I saw a, I saw a uh, study the other day that said because we're trapped the way we are and everything's online, that the temptation for that has risen by like 700%. But let me just tell you what the, my point is this. Whether it's, whether it's something that's pornographic or it's other bad things that we've seen or heard or whatever, when we expose it to our brain, there's a little picture there. And I can't tell you how many times... I've talked to people in counseling and prayer, and they say, I've got these things, I can't forget them. I've seen them, and I can't get them out of my brain. I've done them, and I can't get them out of my brain. And you know how? Do you know what works? Counseling helps. Prayer helps. But do you know what helps for sure? Exposing it to light. When you expose it to light, it's like flooding that dark room, and light makes it dispel. Light gets rid of the darkness. Are you following me? That's a really good example. I hope you can make sense out of that, especially you who don't understand about film. Maybe you need to know, go watch a YouTube video about Kodak or something. I don't know. <clears throat> but listen, let God's word in. Get God's word in and let it help expose the darkness. It's a good thing. Don't hide things. You can't hide them from God anyway. So really, it's not helping. It's just keeping you in darkness. God knows about it. But unless you admit it, confess it, ask for help for it, expose it to light, God can't and won't do anything about it. But at the moment that you do, God says, now I can get rid of it. Isn't that good? Yes, it's good. Let me, let me read this scripture to you. In Luke chapter 11, verses 33 through 36 says this. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in might see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. In other words, your eye lets in things Light. When your eye lets in light, then your body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, it says your body is full of darkness. So you see good things, there's goodness in you. You see bad things, there's badness in you. See, you thought it was just your mama or your preacher that was telling you don't look at all that bad stuff. The Word of God is telling you be careful little eyes what you see. That's not just good, good children's church. You know, and, and let me tell you this, grown folks. What you teach your children... It's good for the grown-ups. Amen? It says, Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of the lamp gives you light. Now, let me ask you this. How much darkness do we see on our daily basis? In our daily lives, on a daily basis, how much darkness do we really see? Darkness and immorality is everywhere. Everywhere. How much time do we spend looking at it? What if we took the same amount of time that we take when we have to be around darkness, or we choose to look at certain things that maybe we should or maybe we shouldn't? 
If we took that same amount of time and looked at light, read the Bible. It has the power to dispel darkness and it has power to change your life. All right, let's look at number two. Light recovers lost things. Light recovers lost things. Let me ask you this question. If you lose something, you usually, typically, will get a light and look for it. This, this happens to my son on a, I'm talking about daily, if not multiple times a day basis. My oldest son will lay his phone in his lap, will lay something down, will put the remote control. John David spends more time looking under the couch and behind the couch than he does sitting on the couch. And he usually, Dad, you got a light? Dad, can I have your, can I have your phone? Let me, let me see the flashlight. I'm like, where's yours? I'm looking for it. Because it, it, it never ceases to fail. But listen, that's what we do, right? We drop something in the car under the seat. We can't see it. If it's under the couch or if it's somewhere we can't, we get light and we go looking for it. Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. And this allegory from Jesus is actually placed right between two other stories, the lost sheep and the shepherd. How many of you know he's not talking about sheep and shepherd? He's talking about people and Jesus and the prodigal son. And again, he's talking about us, people. So right in the middle of that, we have this story about a woman who has lost something. And let's start at verse 8 and read it. We're going to read through verse 10. It says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses a coin... Loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, this is what Jesus says, and then he connects it back to people. I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so, light recovers <coughs> light recovers lost things so we'll talk about people we'll get back to that in just a minute but let me ask you something what if you just lose stuff what if you lose your job get a lamp is what i'm telling you get a lamp read the word it has an answer for you we'll look at that in a second as well what if you lose a relationship what if you lose an investment what if you do something that makes you lose your integrity or lose your reputation Where's your answer? Get a lamp. Anytime you lose something, you get the word of God, you get the light, you get the lamp, and let it help you find that which was lost. Can you say amen? All right. Now let's talk about people. Because there is a built-in tension with people between what we feel and what we know. Between what we think and what we feel and what we know. Right or wrong? You, you, you following me? I'm going to show you an example in just a second. I'm going to show you what the scripture says. But you ever knew you should do something and then you wind up not doing it because you didn't feel like it? Or you thought it was okay if you didn't? Or worse than that, have you ever known that you shouldn't do something and you wind up doing it anyways because you felt like it or because you thought it'll just be okay. It's just a little bitty thing. You know what I'm saying? There is a big tension between what we know to be right and what we think and what we feel. Now, let me show you something very important about this process from the scripture. And I'm going to pull something out. Remember, we talked about exegesis, if you allow me to use that term again. We talked about this word, pulling out. I want to show you something from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And it says this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, we have already seen in, in the very recent past that your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And so... This scripture is telling us, and what we understand is, that we make decisions based off of what we think and what we feel. That's the fact. This is how we decide things according to our will. We decide how we feel, how we think, and then we decide. But the Bible says in this scripture 
that it doesn't divide the soul. In other words, it doesn't divide our mind, will, and our emotions. No, it divides between the soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and the spirit. So in other words, watch this. It divides between what we think is right, what we feel is right, and what we know is right. That's where the Word of God comes in. And so that's why I often say, <clears throat> for a believer, you're going to be tempted. And there are going to be times that you're going to fall. But here's a fact. If you sin, based on my experience and my understanding of things, you're going to have to deny the Holy Spirit and the Word of God at least two, sometimes, typically, usually, three times. The Spirit is going to try to help you not do that. Because there's this tension and the word is telling us we don't want to lose what God has given us. We don't want to lose what God has changed. We don't want to lose the progress we have made. And so stop feeling your way through life. Stop going on what you think because it's not really important what you think unless what you think lines up with what God thinks and what his word says. Because we got to go with what the word of God says. Somebody say amen. Now here's the last one. Light shows the way. Light shows the way. It says it's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It shows the way. Anybody, listen, I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this one because I'm pretty sure it'll be 100%. But let me ask it anyways. Anybody ever had a decision that you needed to make? Any kind of decision, big decision especially. Yeah, everybody has, right? Of course you have. <clears throat> now, many decisions are just small, insignificant decisions. We make them every day. And they don't take a lot of thought. But we have a lot of things in our life that are big decisions. Buying a car. Buying a house. What job do I take? What college do I go to? What person do I date? What person do I marry? What person do I hang around? Who do I allow to be friends? What do I share with this person over here? Can I trust this one? All of these things that are in our minds and in our thinking process, we have to make these choices and decisions. And I want to tell you that light shows the way. Now, the Bible talks about two kinds of revelations, specific revelations and general Revelations. For instance, here's a, here's, here's, a, here's a for instance. The general revelation of the Word of God is how to be married. The specific revelation is who do you marry? So you follow that? <clears throat> and God will give you very specific revelation. Now, sometimes he, he does it right to you. In other words, he speaks right to you. He does that. And he can do that, but he also gives us many, many, many times specific revelation from his word. Now, let me show you how to get an answer, a specific revelation from the word of God. All right. So here's what we're going to look at. How to get a word from God from God's word. How to get a word from God from God's word. Quick question first. Have you ever had a question or thought and then felt like the Lord or the Spirit told you, you need to go read this scripture? Anybody? It happens to me a lot. Anybody else it happens to a lot? You say, well, I, got, I wonder about this. I wonder about that. And a scripture comes to your mind. And it's the Spirit saying, go read this scripture. Now, how many of you have ever thought, well, I know what that scripture says. I've read it a hundred times. Can I tell you that God's up there going, I know what it says too. And I'm telling you to go read it because you don't see everything every time. That's what we talk about with that rhema word that, oh, I didn't ever see that before. You've actually seen it, but it wasn't applicable at that moment. So you just leap right over that application. So what we do is we need to listen to the Spirit of God when He's telling us to go and read the Scripture, regardless of how many times you know it, regardless of if you know it by heart, you will see things that you may not have ever seen before. Now, Here's how we get a word of the, from the Lord, from the word of the Lord. Three words. Praise, prayer, and proclaim. Praise, prayer, and proclaim. First, 
you enter God's presence with praise. Psalm 100 verse 4 says that we enter with His presence with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. And so listen, <clears throat> what you might want to do is when you have to make a big decision and you're getting ready to search the word for it and you're getting ready to ask God to help you put on some praise and worship music and have yourself in an atmosphere and an attitude of praise and thanksgiving. Second, pray. Prayer. And this is what I want to tell you. Pray about what you need to pray about. You don't have to go through this whole litany of things that God, I did, I did, and I bless you and I thank you and you're so wonderful. And, you know, all those are good, but sometimes you can just get right to the point with God and he's okay with that. Pray about what you need to pray about. And I suggest in this moment that you write your prayer down because not only will it help you stay focused and specific on things, but it will also help you to be able to look back over time and see I needed an answer from God and he gave it to me from his word and you write it down and then you record the answer and I'm telling you it will do wonders for your faith the next time you find yourself in a situation. And then here's the last one, proclaim. This means read God's word. Proclaim, read it. Let it proclaim to you. Proclaim what he's saying. So you say, well, where do I read? That's a good question, by the way. If you ask that question out loud or in your own mind, good question. Where should I read? How do I know where to read? Here's what I suggest. Here's what I want to tell you. Think about the stories from the Bible. Most of us don't know a specific scripture by heart to where we can go, oh, I know the answer's in James. No, you know a story, though. And Google is your friend. Google has the answer to nearly anything you can think of. You type in the story. Okay, what about the story of the blind man? What about the story of knowing it? What about the story of marriage? You know, if it's just a topic. What about giving? Whatever it is, think about a story from the Bible that are the same as what you need to know about. Marriage, children, buying things, where to go. Who to date? All these things. Whatever the case is, if you think of a story, I guarantee you through Google or through <coughs> a concordance or a Bible app or the Bible itself in the back or you call and text your pastor, some kind of way will help you find the story. And that story and maybe many others like it will speak to you as you read them. I promise you, you will find answers in the Word of God. Now, it's important when we're reading this word, remember we said exegesis. That's taking something out that's in the word. Stick to that process and don't do eisegesis, which is, remember, taking out what you want to take out. So if you go in there, oh, I'm looking for this. You'll find it some way. You can twist it. The devil will help you find it, but you're going to be deceived. So don't go in there trying to read into it. That's what it means, read into, or we can say it another way, take out what you want to see. Take out what it says and stick with the answer. Amen? And remember this exegetical principle or exegetical, with however you want to say it, principle about the Bible. This is pretty common, pretty true on almost every situation. And I want to show you this. Everything in the Bible is true, Old Testament and New Testament. But when it comes to exegesis, as a general rule, the Old Testament has allegorical exegesis and principles. In other words, they are symbolic. They are figurative in meaning. They are general truths that apply uh, to principles in our life. They have allegorical, the Old Testament, allegorical truths and principles. And the New Testament has applicable truths. And principles. They're relevant and you can apply it to what you're going through now. Here I got to figure out what it means and apply it. In the New Testament, most of the time, I can just apply it. That's a general rule. I'll show you an example. The Bible says <clears throat> that Sarah called Abraham Lord. Now that does not mean that's Old Testament. So just show you how the allegory goes. That does not mean that you have to call your husband. Lord, even though some of us think our wives do call us Lord, they don't actually call us Lord. We just think they call us Lord because every time we usually do something or say something, we hear them from across the house, Lord, 
that we, we think they're talking to us, but they're really not. Just a joke, baby. But the Bible says, Sarah called Abraham Lord. That doesn't mean you have to call your husband Lord. But the application here is that you have to respect your husband. Does that make sense to you? Do you follow that? Okay. And remember this. You need to get a word from God and not just think that you know something. You need to get a word from God and not just think that you know something because if you know or you think you know, you may doubt it when it gets tough. If you say, well, I think this is what God's telling me. I think this is what God wants me to do. I think this is where God wants me to move. I think this is the ministry I'm supposed to be in. I think this is the person that I'm supposed to be with. But when you think it, when the going gets tough or the pressure gets on and the rubber meets the road, you will doubt yourself because the enemy will put a lot of pressure on you to do so. But when you have a word from God, you can go through all the stress, all the pressure, all the doubt. Every question will still arise, but you'll be able to sit with confidence and say, it doesn't matter what my brain says. It doesn't matter what my body says. It doesn't matter what my doubt says or what the whole rest of the world says. What matter is, I know what God told me. I have a word from God. Do you understand that? Let me give you an example again, talking about my son, John David. I have thought a ton. I have so many examples I could think of, but this one came to mind. John David, from very early on, very early on, was gifted musically. Still to this day, he could play anything he puts his mind to. He plays the drums, started playing in church at 10 years old. Not because he was the preacher's son, but because he's super talented and we had a need for it. And he stepped right in and, and was doing it. And he began to sing in, in a beautiful voice and anointed. Then he began to write music. And then he wanted to learn how to play guitar. So he got lessons and he learned. Then he, he wanted to learn how to learn more about chords and stuff. So he started taking theory and he, he, he started teaching himself to play the piano, to learn chords and things. And then he learned how the cajon and he was learning the bass. And now he knows the electric guitar. You see what I'm saying? He's just from, some people are like that. Now me, I have a tough time playing the radio, right? I mean, seriously, I can do other things, but I, I can sing. Praise God for that. Some of, some of you may not think I can, but just keep that opinion to yourself. But I remember he began having dreams. Right about the time he was wondering, God, what do you want me to do with my life? He started having these dreams. And it was not too long after September 11th, tragedy happened in New York and the Pentagon. And uh, well, maybe a good, a, a few, a little bit after that, but not too, not too much. And he would come to me and he would say, Dad, I keep having these dreams. And, or I wake up in the middle of the night and I look at the clock and it's 9-11. Or I'll, I'll see something and it's 9-11. I'll be walking by something and it says, look. And he'll just feel drawn to something. He'll look and he'll see the numbers, 9-11. 9-11. He said it's happening over and over and over again. And honestly, I was dealing with a couple of people at that point who, who were basically trying to say that, you know, um, I don't want to get deep into it. But, you know, every time a tragedy happens, we think it's the end of the world and revelation coming to pass. And maybe it is. And the Antichrist was on the scene. And they were trying to tell me this one is the end. You know, all this stuff. And I was dealing with that. And so... My mind was predisposed to that, and I was like, son, it, it, it's, it's just nothing. Don't worry about it. You're fine. You know, it's no big deal. So because of the frustration I was going to, I didn't allow the Lord to speak to me and show me. But mama started thinking and praying. And the Spirit of God told mom, look in Psalms. And so mom said, John David, I'll tell you what you need to do. Go to the Word. And he said, that's a good idea, mama. Where should I look? She said, I heard the Spirit of God say, Psalm 9, 11. Psalm 9, 11. And we looked it up, and this is what it says. Sing praise to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare His deeds among the people. And my son knew immediately that God not only had gifted him 
but is going to use him for worship and preaching the word of God. And when he was at Leah's freshman year, not only was he singing in campus choir and traveling, but he was in the campus praise band and, and worshiping. And he came home one day and declared to us what I know is still his call today. God has called me to pastor and preach his word. Now, it doesn't matter the road he's taken. And, and I'm not bashing him. I love him so dearly. But I want to tell you something. We all go different paths and we do different things. But the call of God is without repentance. And it doesn't matter where he goes or where it takes him. He knows he heard a word from God. And that word will stick with him through thick and thin. No matter what. He'll never have to question what does God want me to do. Because God gave him a word. And I stick and claim that word as well. And I love you, son, if you're listening to this. And God's got his hand on you and you know it. And you're special and you're anointed and you are God's favorite. And you're right up there in my top three. <laughs> He'll understand that. Him and his brother and sister are always saying which one is the favorite. So just a quick example there to show you how God's word will speak to you and show you the way. Light shows the way. Listen, this Bible that we read, this book, is not just words. It is more than just words. And so here's what I want to do. I want to close the way we've been closing lately, and I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I want you to ask yourself this question. Ask the Holy Spirit this question. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this message? Is it about reading the Word of God? Well, yes. I'm certain that it's about reading the Word more, having the Word in you more. Let light like, shine to your path. Maybe it's about an area of darkness. Let light shine. Maybe it's about a decision you have to make, or maybe it's something that you've lost. Listen, don't be afraid to shed light on it. It's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to allow the Spirit of God, the Word of God, to shine light on you. Don't be afraid, friend, because God loves you and He will always do good for you and do good towards you. God will do the best for you. He loves you. Now I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray right now for every person hearing the sound of my voice. God, I pray that you would give them that hunger we've been talking about for so many weeks now. That shut up in their bones like fire. Passion and a hunger for your word. Speak to them, God, for those who need you and they're seeking you desperately. And they're saying, I need a change. I need that light. Or maybe they, they are that, that lost son. They are that lost coin. They are that person we've talked about that was trapped in darkness. Lord, light is shining in their mind and their hearts right now. Draw them to you. Let them cry out to you, Lord. And as they do, we know your Bible says, our word says, your word, our Bible says that they are being saved as they call out to you. And God, call our, our young people. Call our sons and daughters back home. Call us into ministry. Speak to us through your word. Help us with decisions. Help us with everything we need. We know your light can be trusted because you told us it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we just thank you. And we bless you, God. We love you. Now, friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to hit that link. Get in touch with us, and, and we'll be sure to get right back with you. We're praying for you. We love you. We'll put some things in your hands. If you're close to Millersville, Georgia, come join us here. If not, we'll see you online next time. We love you, and God bless you.